my name is Justin Carmona. I'm a fourth year manufacturing engineering technology major. And this is my tutorial for Lab 10, which was using a kick and place procedure on an ABP robot to move an aluminum pin with a pneumatically powered electric system. The process for the lab is that the pin starts at position A1, and the movement pattern will be from A1 to B1, which is on the work object labeled pallet B. The first work object is in pallet A. So the pin starts at A1, then it'll be moved to B1, and then it'll be moved to A2, B2, A3, B3. That pattern repeats. At the end of the first row, it increments up to the next row. It repeats that same pattern here, it increments up to the final row, and then when, pin, when the pin ends up in the final position in the final row, the lab is complete. The procedure to be used requires the origin position, the destination position, the origin work object, and the destination work object, along with a numerical value for the Z offset to use for safe positions. To explain more clearly what's actually going to happen, I've come over to the actual pallet work objects uh, where the lab's going to be run. The starting point for the lab would be the pin in position A1, which would be right here. Rob target A1 is the grip point for A1, so it's when the end effector is right here ready to grip the pin. So the first call of the pick and place procedure would go like this. The end effector would move to a safe position above A1, it would then move down to A1, it would grip the pin, move back up to a safe position above A1, move over to a safe position above B1, move down to B1, ungrip the pin, and then move up to a safe position above B1. And that would be the end of the first call of the pick and place procedure. In the main function of the code, I call the pick and place procedure repeatedly. So the next thing the robot would do would immediately go back down to B1 and grip the pin again, because now it's in the second call of the pick and place procedure. All right, now I'm gonna show you how to define a tool frame. So to start, we go to program data, click tool data, click show, click new. You would title it whatever you want your tool frame to be called. You wanna set the scope to global and storage type persistent, click okay. Then you would click edit, click change value. We're gonna scroll down to mass. We're going to change our mass to not be negative one so that the controller can do a, a correct calculation. We're going to click OK. Now we're going to do edit. We're going to click define. Because I'm going to use the three point method, I will change the number of points to three. And then for each point, I'm going to jog the end effector to a reference point, which in this, plate, in this case is going to be the metal pin on the table. And then I would record the position of the robot at that point. And for each one, I have to have the joints at different angles so that the robot can make a correct calculation. There's point two. I have point two selected. I'm going to click modify position. There we go. Now I'm going to jog away. I'm going to reorient the joints again. There we go. We can call that point three. Click modify position. Click OK. There's a calculation, it all looks good. All right. Now to check that we defined our tool frame correctly, I'm gonna go over to jogging. Uh, I'm going to select the tool that I just defined. I'm going to jog the end effector away so it's clear, and then I'm gonna to change to reorient mode. There we go. And now I'm going to jog and reorient mode, which is reorienting around the tool frame that we just defined the tool center point, which would be the end of the end effector in this case. And it looks good. So that's how you would successfully define a tool frame. All right, now I'm going to show you how to properly define a work object using the three-point method. To start, we're going to go to program data. We're going to select work object data. Click show. We're going to click new. We title our work object whatever we wanted. Make sure our scope is global and our storage type is persistent. Click OK. Now we're going to go into Edit. We're going to click Define. We're going to click Three Point under Object Method, because that's the method we're going to use. I have my first point selected. 
I'm going to jog to my first point. I'm going to modify position. I'm going to jog to my second point. Modify position. Now I'm going to jog to my jog to my third point, which is along the y-axis. Position, click OK. It does the calculation, looks good, we click OK. And now to check that we've properly defined our work object, we go to jogging. We've got our coordinate system set to work object, we've got our tool set to one that we previously defined, and we'll set our work object to the one that we just defined, click OK. We're going to start with the positive Z, which looks good, negative Z, that looks good. Now we're going to do the negative X, that looks good, positive X good, positive y, and negative y. And that all looks good. So that's how you would properly define a work object using the three-point method. Now I'm going to show you how to define the necessary points and rob targets with the pick and place procedure lab. So the first thing we're going to do is go over to the jogging menu. We're going to make sure our coordinate system is set to work object. Our tool is set to the correct tool frame we defined earlier. And our work object is set to the correct work object uh, that a position A1 is above or in, excuse me. Uh, then we're going to go over to program data. Before we do anything, we're going to jog the end effector down to the position we want to record. There we go. Now we click on Rob Target. We click on Show Data. We're going to click on New. We would name the value uh, whatever we need. Our scope is going to be global. Our storage set is going to be constant. We click OK. There we go. That's our saved ROB target at that position right now. If for any reason I need to modify the position of this ROB target, I would need to jog the end effector first to whatever I want to modify the position to be. And then, and only then, I would click Edit and then Modify Position. I get a warning that shows up saying this can't be undone, which is correct. And once I acknowledge that and click Modify, that ROB target value is now the current position of the end effector. The old point coordinates are gone from that value. And that's how you would define points and rob targets. So now I'm going to explain my rabbit code. So up here we've got work object palette A and palette B. Palette A is the palette on the left, palette B is the one on the right. We've got two rob targets, A1 and B1. A1 is the bottom left position on palette A, B1 is the bottom left position on palette B. Then we have a constant numerical value called offset C, which is used for our safe positions. Then we've got a variable rob target, O safe and D safe. O safe is the origin point, D safe is the destination point. Then we've got two work objects, WOBJ O and WOBJ D. WOBJ O is the origin work object, WOBJ D is the destination work object. Going down to our pick and place procedure, we can see that it takes O safe, D safe, WOBJ O, WOBJ D, and offset Z as inputs. First thing the pick and place procedure does is that it moves to a safe point above O safe. It then moves down to OSafe, it grips the pin, it grips based on a procedure I wrote down here that just toggles the output and then waits half a second. It moves back to the safe position above OSafe, it moves to a safe position above DSafe, it moves down to DSafe, it ungrips the pin, which uses another procedure that just resets the output and waits half a second, and then it moves back up to a safe position above DSafe. Going to our main procedure, you can see that the first thing I do is I call the ungrip procedure to make sure the gripper is open. And then I just keep calling the pick and place procedure, passing in the origin point, the destination point, the origin work object, the destination work object, and the numerical offset Z for our safe positions. And that's how the rapid code works for the pick and place procedure lab. So now I'm going to show you how to link Robot Studio to the Teach Pendant. I've got my rapid code open in Robot Studio right now. If I try to make any changes, it tells me that I need to request write access to the uh, teach pendant. So I'm going to click yes. I then get a pop-up on the teach pendant asking me to grant or deny write access. If I click grant, then I'm allowing Robot Studio write access. So now I can do whatever changes I need to do in rapid. But you can see I get this colored line over here that's not green like the rest of the code. This indicates that the changes that I've made in rapid are not on the controller or the teach pendant. 
So for those changes to be applied, I would have to click the Apply button at the top. It'll ask me if I want to apply. I click Yes. Now the bar is green. This is showing that the updated code that's here in Robot Studio is on the controller on the Teach Pendant. So now if I want to go back to using the Teach Pendant, I would just click Revoke, which revokes write access to Robot Studio. If I try Robot Studio, you can see I don't have write access anymore. So that's how you would apply for write access, grant write access, make changes in Robot Studio, and then revoke write access again. After you've loaded your rapid code onto the Teach Pendant, to run it, you need to go to Program Editor, and we can see the code's there, but before we run it, we need to go to Debug, and we need to click on the PP to Main. That's going to move the program pointer to the first line under the procedure so that we know where the program is going to start when it runs and the program is going to run correctly.